right. Good morning once again. Welcome back, everybody. I've uh, started the recording for the second lecture. So we are ready to go. Let's go back to the notes. Um, all right. So we were looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses, sorry, 5 through 7, where Paul is telling us, you know, you're enriched in everything by him. That means Christ has made our lives that much more richer, better, fuller, meaningful, enriched our lives. And then he also includes in that enriching the expression of spiritual gifts, right? He says, all utterance, all knowledge, as the testimony of Christ or the working of Christ was confirmed in you or was evident in you, so that you come short in no gift. So that's why we are saying this utterance and knowledge has is with respect to gift, charisma, which later on in First Corinthians 12, he explains to us the charisma. The utterance are the vocal gifts. The knowledge are the revelation gifts. Um, so he says, you come short and know this, none of this. So one of the ways in which I want us to, you know, apply this scripture, or at least I apply the scripture, and maybe, uh, you know, you could do it if you want, is... Uh, you know, uh, many times, uh, you know, even though uh, I have been ministering God's word for for a long time, even today, many times I feel insufficient myself. Like I feel insufficient in my own self to minister. There may be different situations uh, when, you know, I'm called to go and minister. On the one hand, uh, I, I, I know the grace of God and I know the gift of God. I, I know the work of the Holy Spirit. I know the anointing uh, is there and I, I don't doubt that. But I still, there are times when I still feel like, oh God, in my own self, I don't have what is needed to, you know, for that situation, for that occasion. So in my own self, I feel inadequate, insufficient, you know, to minister. So that is when I come to this truth. See, you know, God in Christ, I have been enriched in everything, in everything. That means even to rise up, to be able to meet this particular situation, this particular need, God, you have enriched me. If you have made me able to meet, and uh, one of the scriptures that I really like uh, to to really lean on, to depend on in situ times when I feel inadequate, is the scripture in Second Corinthians chapter three and verse five. You know where the apostle Paul says, uh, "Not that we are sufficient of ourselves." to think of anything as being from ourselves. But our sufficiency is from God. And he goes on here in the next verse. He says, uh, he has made us able ministers of the new covenant. He has also made us able ministers of the new covenant. So I lean on this. I say, God, I thank you that you have made me a uh, sufficient, uh, a capable minister of the New Testament, because my sufficiency comes from God. Uh, my sufficiency is not from myself, but my sufficiency, my ability to rise up to the occasion, to meet this need, comes from God. Sometimes you are talking to people, and uh, it can be very difficult. Uh, they may have all kinds of questions, uh, or sometimes they'll be going through some very challenging situations for which you yourself don't have any answers. I mean, you said, I don't know what to say, you know, uh, because the problems are so big. But that's when 
uh, you know, we may feel like, oh God, I don't know what to do. I don't even know what to say. I don't know how to help the person. Uh, but that's when we say, God, I thank you. You have enriched me in everything. Even in this situation, Jesus, you enrich me. And my sufficiency is not from myself, but my sufficiency is from God, who makes me capable of handling this situation, to minister in this situation, to minister to this need, to be able to address, you know, the questions, the challenges that are uh, before us, you know. So uh, that's one way in which, you know, I, uh, from time to time, I keep coming back and applying uh, this truth that in Christ, in Christ, I'm sufficient. God has made us sufficient. Uh, he has enriched us in everything. Um, we are not, uh, I don't know, I'm not lacking in, in, in what's needed, you know, in, in the gifts to minister to people. Right. So if you if you if you want to, you could also, you know, use apply this truth in a similar way. The next part, next part of our inheritance, and I'm just we're just itemizing these things, is that you know, as part of our inheritance, God has said He will always cause us to triumph. Right. Let's read this scripture, please. Second Corinthians two and verse fourteen. Somebody could read it for us. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. Amen. Mm. Amen. So Paul is saying thanks to God. Why? Because he always leads us in triumph, in Christ. So now, remember, this is in Christ. So this is your in Christ blessing. It's your, uh, you know, your in Christ uh, provision. This is for you in Christ, for me in Christ. What, is, what does God do? He always, he always, and that word is important, always. That means in every situation, in every circumstance, this is your provision. Always, God always leads us in triumph, or uh, like the King James would say, He causes us to triumph. The the actual in the Greek, and uh, the Apostle Paul is having a mental picture, right, of what he's writing. Uh, he's having this picture of a of a king who has conquered his enemies. Yeah, he's conquered, he's triumphed, and he's leading this victory procession. Right? So the king is triumphant. He's leading this victory procession, and you know, and, and, and so the people, his people are being led in triumph, in victory. So it's kind of that kind of a picture, the background. So he says, God always leads us in this kind of a victory procession. He always causes us to triumph. So God is the one who's causing you to win. God is the one who's causing you to triumph in Christ. And what is the outcome? Through us, there's the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. That means wherever we go, in every place. So that's again another thing, in every place, whether it's at work, at home, at in, in your community, in your city, wherever, in every place, this is what should be known, that God is causing you to win. God is causing you to triumph in Christ. So this is your inheritance in Christ. It is our, and God has given it to us as a provision. He says, look, I will always lead you in triumph in Christ. So, again, any situation you face in life, you and I must have the attitude of a winner, as winners. Any situation. Now, of course, when the situation comes, it hit us hard. Okay? A difficult situation. 
an unexpected situation comes suddenly. It hits you hard. Like, whoa, where did this come from? You know, what is this all about? How am I going to handle this? Wow, you know, this challenge or this trouble or this difficulty. What is this? It came your way. And at that moment, it might shock you. It might, you know, uh, it, it, it might seem overwhelming. But in that situation, you need to tell yourself and you also need to announce to the situation, God causes me to triumph over this situation in Christ. Because that's your inheritance. That's your provision. That's what God has given you. So you say, thanks be to God. He always, even in this situation, causes me to triumph because I am in Christ. And through me, in this situation and in this place, will come the aroma, the sweet fragrance of his knowledge. Speak like that. Declare like that. Be confident about that. Because that is the word of God. Now, sometimes it's not easy. I acknowledge that. That sometimes, you know, uh, it's not easy to stand uh, up. Because, you know, the, the, the situation might seem so big and you're like immediately... Your mind is maybe troubled, what you know, disturbed, discouraged, whatever. But you and I must make a choice. In spite of how you feel, in spite of how big the situation might be, you and I have to make a choice. I am in Christ. This situation does not in any way affect who I am in Christ. Who I am in Christ has not changed. And in Christ, God always causes me to triumph. And through me, he will diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge, even in this place, in this situation. That's how we must live. Because God always causes us to triumph in Christ. Now, I'm not saying that there won't be any battles to fight. Okay, that would be uh, an untruth. Because, you know, 1 Timothy 6.12, the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. So that means there's going to be a battle. That's why you and I have to fight. And it's a fight of faith, meaning it's a fight that you and I, oops, um, you and I have to engage by faith and in faith, right? So it's a fight of faith. So there is a battle. But as you are engaged in the battle, you engage with this confidence that God will cause me to triumph. The battle may be long. The battle may be hard. The battle sometimes may be intense. It's okay. God is causing me to triumph. And I'm going to come out the winner. So I'm going to stay in the battle. I'm not going to run away from the fight. I'm going to stay in the fight. Because I just have to stay in the fight. And God will cause me to triumph. That's how. You and I must face life because this is our inheritance in Christ. Now, related to this is another truth that we have been born to overcome. It's kind of kind of connected to what we've already said. Could somebody read first John chapter five, verse one and four, please? First John chapter five, verse one and four. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him, who is begotten of him. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. So, notice what's going, what he says here. 
Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. All right? So you are born of God. And, okay, I think I need to mute somebody's mic. Um, okay. All right. Sorry, there was a little bit of background noise, so. Right, let's, get, let's get back to the notes. All right. So, because you and I believe in Jesus, we believe Jesus is the Christ, what we are born of God. That means it's God has given birth to us, that we have received life from God. And then verse 4 says, Whatever is born of God, or whoever is born of God, what? Overcomes the world. So God has already said that you are an overcomer. That you overcome the world. So to overcome means to have victory. To have mastery to have dominion over the world what is the world the world uh, according to john's writings represents everything that's of, of darkness everything that is evil everything that is in rebellion against god everything that is opposite to god so that's how john uses the term the world anything that's of darkness anything that's of the devil anything that's against god it's the world and john says whoever is born of god that means you me each one of us as children of god we overcome we have victory over we have dominion over Everything that's in it, that's evil, everything that's of the darkness, everything that's against contrary to God, you have victory over. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. That means, look, our faith in God has already put us in this place of victory. Our faith in God has already put us in a place of victory and it is, our, it is through our faith in God that we continue to walk in this place of victory. So you are an overcomer. Always, all the time, every situation, you are an overcomer. This is your inheritance. So like we said earlier, same example, in the world, we will face different things. Things that are opposite to God. Then you remember that the world represents anything that's evil, that's anything against God. Anything that's unholy or wicked, evil, sinful. When, when you and I face those things, don't say, oh, this is going to put me down, this is going to knock me out, this is going to signal my end. Don't speak like that. Remember, because you're a child of God, you are an overcomer. You overcome the world. And it is through faith. So keep your faith strong and you stand. Whatever you face. So look, I may be facing sickness, I may be facing financial need, I may be facing some trouble from people, I may be facing whatever, you know, whatever the situation is. I'm an overcomer. God said, everyone who is born of him overcomes the world. So you look to God and say, Father, I thank you that you've made me an overcomer. I'm expecting to come out the winner in this situation. I'm not denying the situation. I'm not denying the problem. Yeah, it is there. But this is how I face the problem. I face it as an overcomer. 
God, you'll bring me out as a winner. And all I need to do is to keep my faith in God strong. Because it is through that, through that faith in God, I'm going to walk in that place of overcoming uh, as a victor in victory. Thanks be to God. Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, Thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, he's writing in the context of death. It's like this is the worst that this world can throw at you and me, death. In the face of death, Paul is saying, Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So even in death, you know, we're going to come out triumphant. And so that's why I said in everything between sin and death, we reign over, we will die, but even, even death will not be the final thing because God will cause us to triumph over death. He is going to resurrect our bodies and uh, we have victory even over death. Okay, a few other things. Uh, I don't know, I listed about I don't know, 17 things, I guess, but you know, we'll just go through them. I just want us to be aware that all these things are there for us uh, as part of our inheritance in Christ. The next one, the promise of life. So let's read the second Timothy chapter one, verse one. Can somebody read that for us, please? Second Timothy chapter one verse one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you. So Paul is telling us something that we have in Christ Jesus. What do we have in Christ Jesus? We have the promise of life so in christ god has promised us something he's promised us life now it's interesting when you study the new testament on the subject of on, on life and and then you find that uh, there is that there are different Greek words used for the word life, right? There is the word bios, which simply represents biological life, physical life. There is um, uh, the, the word life, the, the word zoe, which is used very, very specifically to talk about the life that comes from God. So in the Greek, there is this word zoe. So there's another Greek word, anastrophe, which talks about manner of life, that is behavior, how one lives. But this word zoe, is very exclusive. It's, it's used only to talk about eternal life or the life, the God quality of life or the life that God gives to us, Z-O-E, Zoe. So what the Bible is telling us is that in Christ Jesus, God has promised us this Zoe, this, this God kind of life, this quality of life that comes from God, this eternal life. And uh, we know, uh, 1 John 5 and verse 20, it says, you know, we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding that we may know who he was true. Uh, this is the true God and uh, this is the true God and eternal life. That is to know him, to know him who is true, to know Jesus. And 1 John 5, 14, 15 says, you know, if you have the Son, you have life. And uh, so we have life. We've been, this is the promise of life. So we have this life. We live 
this life and this life will this eternal life will will be consummated meaning it's it's going to get bigger and grander and better and brought to its fullness when our bodies are transformed our bodies are glorified and we put on immortal bodies that's in the future but right here and now we have zoe the life of god in us in christ jesus so in jesus you have life eternal life because you know the one who is true now this life is uh, and i haven't mentioned it here but this eternal life is god's life in us okay let's just look at a few other scriptures uh, to help us understand something about eternal life you know we could we could uh, do a, a wonderful study on eternal life itself but i just want to bring our attention to a few things uh, let's go to john 5 uh, these are not in the notes, so if you want to write it down on a piece of paper, you're welcome to do that. Uh, just a little insight here about this eternal life, okay? John 5 and verse 26. Can somebody read that for us? John 5, verse 26. John 5, 26. Go ahead. Anyone? John, John 5, 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Okay. As the Father has life, Zoe, as a father has Zoe in himself, he has granted the son to have Zoe in himself. So what is Zoe? It is the life that God has in himself. That's Zoe. That is this word eternal life. So what is Zoe? What is this eternal life? The life that the Father has in himself, which the Son has in himself. That's the life God has given to you and me, Zoe. So what is eternal life? What is the life that you and I have? Zoe, it's the life that God has in himself, that Jesus has in himself. That's the life that you and I have. Eternal life. It ha And we have it now in Christ. So the life of God is in you. The life of God is in your spirit. Because he who has the Son has life, Zoe. You have Zoe, the very life that God has in himself, which Jesus has in himself. That same life has been granted to you and me. Now, like we said, there are many things we can discover about Zoe in the Bible. I just want us to go to chapter 1 of John, John chapter 1. And let's read verses 4 and 5, please. John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Somebody can read it. 
John chapter 1, verse 4 to 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen. Mm. Amen. Once again, verse 4 says, In him was life. This very unique word, Zoe. In him. In Jesus. In him was Zoe, this eternal life. And the life was the light of men. That means this life, the life of God, the Zoe, illuminates man. It gives man light. It 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 releases the light of God into human people, to life, to humans. So the life illuminates, it releases the light of God. And verse 5 says, this light shines in darkness. What happens when light shines in darkness? Darkness leaves. And so verse 5 says, this light shines in darkness, and darkness could not stop it. It couldn't overpower it, overcome it. So, what does it mean to have the life of God? What does it mean to have the promise of life in Christ? This life that God has given to us in Christ. We have the very life of God in us. And what does this life do? It releases the light of God. And wherever this light shines, darkness leaves. So, darkness has no place in you and in me. It's no place. Why? Because you have life. You have the God kind of life. And his life in you fills you with the light of God. And the light drives out darkness wherever it goes. So you need to say that about yourself. I have life. His life in me enlightens me, fills me with the light of God, and darkness has no place in me. Darkness has no place in me. Anything that represents darkness, anything that represents the devil, has no place in me because his life is in me and his life is my light. His life fills my whole being with the light of God and the light of God drives out every form of darkness out of my life. Okay, so keep this simple truth in mind. You and I have the promise of the God kind of life in Christ Jesus. Next one. We are sealed with the Spirit. Could somebody read for us Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, please? Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So you see these words, in him. That's in Christ. In whom? Again, in Christ. So it's talking about what we have in Christ. In Christ, after we trusted and you know, after we heard the word of truth, the message of the gospel, we believed. What happened? We were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We were sealed. The word seal, it's, it simply means to put a stamp 
of ownership. So you and I have God's seal on our lives. You have God's mark of ownership that secures you. So spiritually, the Holy Spirit in you is God's seal of ownership of you. So we are sealed with the Spirit. I'm God's property. You are God's property. And uh, he says, you know, the Holy Spirit, the seal of the Holy Spirit is also a guarantee of the inheritance, you know, that we will receive when the, when the redemption of the purchased possession takes place. That means there is a future part to our inheritance. Right? So there is a there's a present part of our inheritance, which we have been talking about. But there is also part of our inheritance that is kept for later when uh, we, who are the purchased possession, are redeemed. That means, you know, he's referring to the future point in time when God will transform these bodies of ours uh, into glorified bodies. We'll be fully redeemed. That means we will experience the fullness of our redemption, which includes these bodies putting on glorified bodies. Right? So he's saying the Holy Spirit, the seal of the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of even that part of our inheritance. So, inheritance. so God is saying, okay, look, I've given you the Holy Spirit. It's, it's this, this Holy Spirit in you is like a down payment, is an assurance to you that uh, whatever is still yet to come, I'll get it to you. Right? So the seal of the Holy Spirit is important in two ways. One, it's God's mark of ownership on our lives. You and I are God's purchased possession. See? Seal of the Holy Spirit, purchased possession. We are the pur God's purchased possession. We are marked by God. God is saying, that person is my property. And the seal of the Holy Spirit is also God telling you and me, look, I will bring the full redemption to you. I'll the rest of your inheritance, which includes the glorified bodies and everything else after, I will get it to you. It's my guarantee. So we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So anytime you have a doubt about, you know, this... Am I still with God? Is God still with me? Tell yourself and just speak out and say, I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. You know, God marked me with his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit in me is a guarantee of what is still to come. I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. I've been marked by God. I'm God's property. Okay. We are also preserved in Christ. That means God is going to protect you. He's going to take care of you in Christ. So James chapter 1, uh, sorry, Jude 1, when I think James, uh, Jude 1 verse 1, uh, Jude writes, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, uh, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. So you are preserved. Right? That means God is going to keep you safe in Christ. And nobody can touch you there. You're preserved in Christ. Now let's try to quickly go over a few more. And uh, we are established or made firm, made secure in Christ, right? So he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. So God is the one who makes us firm in Christ and he has anointed us in Christ. 
Okay, so you are you are established, you are anointed in Christ. You're firm. Nothing can shake you. Right? So when you feel like being shaken, you say, No, I've been established in Christ. He who establishes me in Christ, who has anointed me, is God. God has established me. God has anointed me in Christ. Okay. Uh, in Christ, we are also part of an eternal purpose. One, zero, three. Okay. Uh, that means Ephesians 3.11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus. So that means in Jesus, God is carrying out an, an eternal purpose, an overarching purpose. God is unfolding in Jesus Christ, in and through Christ. And you and I, being in Christ, have been called according to that purpose which he has, which is unfolding in Christ, right? So this purpose and grace was given to us in Christ Jesus, right? So you and I are part of this eternal purpose which God is working out in Christ which he has called us to in Christ. And Paul personalizes it when he says, you know, I press toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ. So Paul is personalizing it. Look, there is a call of God in Jesus. There is a goal that I'm pressing forward to in Christ. Right? So in Christ, we are people with a divine purpose. It's, it's beyond, you know, the ordinary goal of, okay, you make money, you have a living, uh, you pay your bills, and, uh, you know, you live and die. Uh, that's normal, that's natural, but we have something above that, beyond that, grander and bigger than that, which is the eternal purpose of God, to which we are called in Christ, and each one of us are living with that sense of eternal purpose, that God has called me, and I have to do live for that purpose, have to glorify Christ, and that purpose supersedes. It's, it's much bigger than just the ordinary things. The ordinary things are important. I'm not saying it's not. We have to take care of those things. But we live with a sense of eternal purpose that has been given to us in Christ Jesus. Okay? I'm going to stop here for today. We will pick the, from 104. We'll start from here. Uh, we'll continue on this next week. And uh, um, I trust all of you have uh, stayed with me. We've just been looking at different uh, pieces or portions of our inheritance. And as you can see, it covers various facets of our earthly life, uh, various aspects of our earthly life. All of these are part of our inheritance. We're you know, and everywhere we saw it's in him, it's in Christ, it's in Jesus. So uh, we need to begin to, you know, assimilate that and say, God, I accept it. I'm going to live out of those things, uh, out of my inheritance in Christ, and I'm going to walk in that inheritance. Okay, we will go through the rest uh, next week. I uh, just want you to continue to think about these things, continue to feed your spirit uh, with these things. Okay. Any questions before we close in prayer? Okay. No questions. Okay. Fine. Let's take a moment to pray together. We'll close. Um, I know we, we still have a few more minutes, but uh, I thought it's enough for today. You know, you've, you've heard so much that others get a little overload of uh, uh, different points. But let's pray together. Let close. Can I request somebody, please, to just unmute your mic and pray together with the class and dismiss us, please? Let's pray. Our heavenly loving Father, once again, Lord, we thank you so much for speaking to us this morning. 
Lord, I thank you so much for your dear beloved servant, Lord, uh, helping him to, helping all of us to understand, Lord, who we are in you, Master. Lord, you bless us, Lord, that when, Lord, we are weak, when, Lord, we are insufficient, Lord, that very moment, Lord, we will know that you are with us and your word strengthens us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you bless us, Lord, that one day, Lord, we will see that you are really at work in our life now ministry master that every moment lord we decrease let you glorified exalt in our life master mm -hmm. i pray that lord let our light life be a blessing a, a channel of blessings a light to this uh, darkness for lord mm -hmm. once again lord i thank you for the pastor lord continuously blessing bless his family and bless his ministry lord thank you so much in jesus name i pray amen 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 all right thank you everyone uh, I'll see you all on Friday. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day and uh, rest of the week. God bless. See you again. Amen.